Welcome to the very first episode of What's So Great. The series is all about nothing but the great stuff in gaming. Each episode, we take a look at a game, we look past the hype and negativity, doesn't matter if the overall experience is great or terrible, and we find everything good underneath all of that. The reason it just might be worth playing. Doesn't matter how poorly we reviewed the game, if there's good in there, we'll find it. Let's call it a reverse cinema sins, or a gaming cinema wins, except, well, different. In this first episode, it's a game that people kind of forgot existed until it came out. But surprise, it's here. It's a post-apocalyptic open world game that asks you to survive in a place that wants absolutely nothing more than to make sure that you do not. Today, we're answering the question, what's so great about Rage 2? Oh, and don't worry, this is a very new release, so no story spoilers, and I'll keep the gameplay to the first half or so of the game for the most part. Number one, and this is the only time I'm going to talk about this for this entire video. There are microtransactions, but thankfully, they are literally and only superfluous cosmetics that are absolutely meaningless. Just gun skins. That's it. The story opens with a villain discussing how stupid the heroes were for stopping the genocide. Non-traditional way to start a story. Quickly introduce the villain and motivation. General Cross wants to cleanse the planet to allow a new species to dominate. The leader of the authority. It's a nice quick cutscene to catch everybody up on everything that's happened. One of the better, hey, here's what you missed cutscenes I've seen in a game this past couple years. It also helps that General Cross's design is pretty menacing and quite awesome. I mean, dude looks like an 80s horror villain mixed with a transformer. No controversy here, it's really simple, you play who you want, the selected character offers male or female, easy, appropriate, and oh goodness look, no articles from Kotaku being written about how this is not right. Weapon intros are slick, very Doom-like, very id. They know exactly what they're doing and they're fetishizing the violence in the best way possible. This zipline scene here, smartly and gruesomely, at the very beginning of the game, gives you a good view of what you're going to be fighting against for the next 15 or so hours. This is how you introduce a new enemy type. This is also horrifying. Some guns have alt fires that's as simple as activate by going ADS or hit firing. Like your starting pistol, which has a burst fire mode if you hit fire, and a single round fire mode if you ADS. This is how you simplify a control scheme in an FPS. Filtrite cells are like Doom health pickups that similarly encourage aggressive play and the quick pace of the gunplay makes this a great design decision to keep you pressing forward instead of playing it like a cover shooter. Because my god, is this game not built to be played like a cover shooter? Except for when the game literally gives you a, a deployable cover later, but we'll get there. This is awesome. Holy shit. It took his whole head off! And then you just pick up the dude's armor and put it on like it's no big deal, like we didn't just see what happened in that armor. That's the tone this game's going to give you. It works. The main stick is a literal fillet boomerang, this time a truly terrifying weapon that requires skill to use properly. Killing a bunch of enemies in a row charges overdrive, which recoups health and basically turns you into Rambo. It's a nice reward for skillful or even risky play. Building up your combo builds that meter quicker, and the bottom left skull meter keeps track of these combos. Speaking of Rambo, video games have seemed to figure out that turning you into a superhero is, well, a ridiculous proposition. So it doesn't try to sugarcoat it or take it too seriously, the game literally says, hey, you're getting superpowers at the press of a button, yay! But it's a good intro to just why you should search for the arcs in the world, given what they offer, weapon and nanotrite wise, and how much powerful you grow from finding them. Speaking of nanotrites, they're the abilities that you get that turn you into a wasteland avenger. They are awesome. Shatter, for example, which you should get immediately, can be used strategically to strip armored enemies before decimating them. Not just, oh look, cool stuff, these powers are necessary strategically. Throughout all this, the game gets you into the open world and gets you started literally within half an hour. Too many games have overly long intros. Too many intros feel like really long, borderline Game of Thrones last season-esque episodes of, hey, watch me explain stuff to you for a really long time that you really don't care about. But here, the world is fully open to you just a few minutes after you start that game up. Also, so are motorcycles, and riding a motorcycle is so cool. Seriously, find a motorcycle. It's one of the only vehicles where you'll really see yourself, and trust me, this does not get old. I look like John Travolta and Wild Hogs. While in that open world, roaming traders will make the world feel a bit more alive and engaging, as well as a tad more realistic. They literally run around, you honk your horn at them, they stop, and you trade with them and get some unique things. More importantly, they're a thing, an NPC that travels this world that you feel like you could actually interact with, which keeps you from feeling a little more alone than you would. With any open world, 
the game is still filled with Ubisoft-like open-world collect-a-thon, go-here stuff, but things like the arcs play to the game's greatest strength. See, by creating genuinely engaging combat, which we'll get talking about, and enemy AI, these outposts and arcs are actually engaging and worthwhile pieces of content as well. So it's not all just meaningless markers. Rage 2 gets enemy variety mostly right. Thanks to reasonably smart AI, Rage is a genuinely fair challenge for a lot of the game. Sure, some weapons in the late game make the game a bit easier, or even early like this rocket launcher you can pick up basically whenever you want, which essentially allows you to take anything in the game out with a blindfold on, like the scene from Avengers 1 where Hawkeye just looks away and shoots. But playing on higher difficulties will beat you down in the best ways possible. With that ever mentioned enemy variety, having to deal with a shielded enemy rushing you in armored when flanking you while rockets rain from above literally never gets old. These guys are some of the most interesting things in the game. Die and Defibrillation is an ability that offsets that with a QTE upon death that makes difficult situations on higher difficulties feel far more fair. It also requires your attention so it isn't just press and forget every time you die. And you can only do it once for a certain amount of time, so if you die twice in a row you don't get to defib again, you're just done. You can hold a button to go into focus mode which will reveal rainbow beams that point to undiscovered arcs making tracking them down, less of an exercise of opening and closing the map in a tiny bit more organic. But with that map closed, movement is so smooth. Between your dash, your grab jump, and some of the powers you get later in the game, man, it almost feels like you're ice skating through this world at times. It almost feels like you're playing a game of chess while your enemies are just kind of watching. And that's if every piece on the chessboard had rollerblades on. They nailed that same feeling of smoothness that we had in Doom just a couple years ago. Also, you can literally kick people's heads in. Trader Towns are cool slices of actual life. They're very Borderlands 2-ish, but they're colorful and worth exploring. Gun Barrel is probably your first exposure to them. Rage 2 is essentially a Wild West simulator. The world is rebuilding, biomes have formed, and trade is amped back up as gangs fight for control of that world. Trader Towns and their often absurd NPCs do feel like they represent this new world in a way that makes sense. It's good world building. Vendors have personalities, and they are weird. Most will have conversations with you as you shop. This talking cactus is ridiculous. I love it. This is the humor that keeps Rage 2 from feeling depressing. They're actually a reference to a restaurant that existed before the apocalypse. They're the speaker boxers for taking or order at Jack's. Characters like John Marshall fit the, hey, we get it, this is a ridiculous post-apocalyptic story vibe perfectly. It's ironic genericness at its best. There's a wasteland wizard named Mangu the Unborn that only appears in certain places at certain times, and he's the only seller of cheat codes that changed the way you play Rage, kinda like back in the day. Weapons have their own ability trees that help to differentiate them, but also allow you to customize your loadout and attach yourself to specific weapons, and the same goes for nanotrites. The combat shotgun is so ridiculously awesome. Between the single fire, good lord you're not part of this area code anymore, and the spread fire that makes it seem like you're bowling at times, surprise surprise, it perfected another shoddy. Climbing ladders is actually a quick and easy activity. Why aren't more games like this? These guys are basically the coolest, most ridiculous enemies you'll see this year. Humor and challenge, the martyr of the year. This guy is your first mini boss. He'll hurl fire nades at you in between chain gun shots, taking him out with an overdrive secondary fire shotgun pull to the head. One of the most intense early game moments. The music. Oh my god, the music. This enemy literally calls his shots, tosses nades into the air, and hits them with a baseball bat while making baseball related quips. He's my favorite. Wellspring Knight is basically Hill Valley and Back to the Future Part 2, dystopian, neon fueled, you're literally there looking for a mayor in a giant hotel looking tower. These are the gems that keep the Wasteland and Rage 2 from feeling too dry, even if they aren't sprawling. And Rage 2 smartly doesn't dive too deep into the well of RPG, it knows what it is. It's a shooter, and people like the Cyberdoc and Wellspring who will reset your abilities for cheap prove what Rage 2 is about fun, not perilous decision making or min maxing. If you use that shotgun right with its all fire, you can set enemies flying stories to their death and maybe the most satisfying haptic and visual feedback for a video game shotgun since Doom. How often do you see people genuinely trying to revive their squad after an encounter in a video game? That's attention to detail. Mutant Bash TV goes a long way to showing what life is like in the apocalypse, the gruesome progression of reality TV, what's entertaining in a world that sees brutality every day, how demented the human mind becomes when it's only exposed to the art of survival. This is, I mean... <laughs> Why isn't every television show hosted like this? I mean, come on. Whereas a lot of arenas and games feel pointless, Mutant Bash TV feels like it could have been the idea they built the whole game around. 
Using some of the smoothest FPS mechanics this gen, you have to kill fastest and as awesomely as possible to raise your score and get tokens that you can use at the gift shop. It is more than a fleeting side attraction, especially if you use the challenge board. It's some of the most fun the game proffers throughout its playtime. Some arenas have hazards like electricity, others focus on certain kinds of foes, but they're all worth playing. Speaking of Mutant Bash TV, that's a spinning gorilla on a track in a jungle with knives coating it. Yep. This is the music for some of the MBTV stages. Classic TV and mutants. A better combo was never found. At a certain point, you'll need to make your way to the Chaz Car Derby. It's called the Chaz Car Derby because, well, it's it's all my Chaz. Racing in Rage 2 is as arcadey as humanly possible, and this is a good thing here. Cars often control a bit like tanks, so to take the frustration out of racing, if you flip your car or end up off the track, the game will immediately teleport you right back on the track. No button presses needed. Cheap? Sure. Good design choice? Of course. The texture work. How detailed the character models here is genuinely astounding at times. You can quite literally see the sweat glistening off old Clegg Clayton here. It's kind of gross, but whatever. This giant mutant Clegg Clayton, named Jumbo, not only has some excellent creature design going on, but this is a boss fight that forces you to use, understand, and time the movement tools at your disposal perfectly. This is how you do a boss fight without taking the player out of the context of the mechanics you've already placed in front of them. Instead of just throwing Jumbo at you and calling it a day, you could find out a ton about him, even how he was fed through logs in that level. But honestly, he's a giant mutant wearing a Hawaiian shirt. Looks like something out of Lilo and Stitch. That's really all you need to know. Blood splatter effects here are insane. Not just the actual texture effects, but the insane amount of new realism here that they push just far enough into fantastical territory with the brighter reds to be some of the most intense effects you'll see in games. You don't see it often, but when you do, oof. You can literally swap grenades out of the sky if you melee at just the right time with a grenade tennis skill. These open world encounters with the authority will terrify you the first time they come popping in. They're much more xenomorph and a lot less dude with a glowing finger. Vehicle combat can be brutal, but it's also one of the more intriguing parts of the open world. For example, taking out this convoy to get to this annihilator and reveal its weak spots is an absolute challenge, especially dealing with the shielded enemies. But man, with the multiple weapons you can have on a car, it is worth it. Vehicle combat is also only forced on you sparingly throughout the campaign, so if it's not your thing, you don't have to engage with it much. The world may not be the most dense, but this guy is an entirely optional mini-boss you could miss entirely if you don't find the arc it's guarding, even though the game tries to push you there anyways. There's a bonus to certain editions of the game, around the mid-game, that tasks you with taking out a cult. The mission itself is standard sewer fare, but the boss is perfect, mostly because at this point in the level you're running low on resources and even with your new revolver, you're forced to figure it out, with likely very few health infusions. How to stay alive to finish this guy off. Rage does a great job even on normal difficulty of giving you more than enough ammo, but just enough resources to keep you feeling like your back's against the wall. For those of you that like to explore organically, or at least semi-organically, Rage won't give you drive markers for mission objectives automatically. Instead, you have to manually place a waypoint for your drive markers just in case you want to find your own way using just the compass. The events of the first Rage have their fingerprints all over too. No spoilers, but there will be a lot of references to the first in your playthrough. Some massive, some subtle. All of the Mutant Bash TV arenas have very different themes and challenges like this sniper challenge. They are dramatically different than anything else you will get throughout the rest of the game. When you pick up a bounty in a town, it tells you what that person is wanted for. It's usually something ridiculous like poisoning a pot of spaghetti. Yep, the wasteland is ruthless. The lagoon swamp area of the map, especially, well, Lagoony, has a pretty ubiquitous New Orleans vibe, even going as far as dressing some characters like Mo here in Mardi Gras colors and shades. Talking to people in trade towns will organically open up world events or activities on your map in a way that is totally missable otherwise. But in that map, the world isn't full of life, but there are a lot of moments like these spread out across the world to keep exploring it interesting, even in spaces that are devoid of actual points of interest. The color work in Rage 2 is ridiculously beautiful. Even in a wasteland, Rage Man is to be one of the prettiest games to take place in the post-apocalypse in terms of its vibrancy in the past few years outside of maybe Far Cry New Dawn. Rage uses pockets of color in the world to keep it all from blending in, so where a lot of the wasteland can be bland, it's locales like these that stand out. This is partly because Avalanche really wanted the game's aesthetic to be inspired by 80s and 90s comics. They reference European apocalyptic comics, which used tons of bright colors during that era as inspiration. This mad scientist and his Igor highlight just how much rage leans into its ridiculousness and how strange some of the writing of the game is in the best way possible. This is disturbing humor, even the music plays into its cartoony and weird nature. At one point an Avalanche developer came out before release and said, they will not sit here and tell you a deep story is why you should play Rage 2. They meant it. The locale diversity, at least in interiors, in Rage 2 is spot on. One second you'll be in a space center, the next an abandoned warehouse or an old hotel, while the outside world may be very reminiscent of Avalanche Studios' current-gen Mad Max at times, the interior variety makes up for that. 
It's this very space center where you can see just how much detail was paid to making sure Rage's world didn't feel sterile. Like this poster of Elon Tusk that mocks the space mogul's egocentric nature. I'm sure he'll pretend to be stoked at being made fun of. The wing stick I mentioned before acts like a boomerang, but it's like the rest of the game is a nice skill curve. You quickly gain the ability to lock on and control its trajectory, and if you hit something, even change its trajectory again to hit another enemy. This allows you to skillfully use a stick without losing ammo due to poorly placed shots. Rage makes smart use of that aforementioned color in lighting to literally light the way or direct the player towards points of interest or the objective without utilizing invasive markers or immersion breaking arrows mid-level. Like here, where the purple lights point you towards the floor below. There are next to no loading screens in Rage. At all. You'll go from cutscene, to game, to interior, to exterior, to biome, to biome, into car and out of car seamlessly without loading for a second, making everything feel far more immersive. And even when you have to fast travel, load times are extremely short. This guy's design. A three stage fight during which he's invulnerable until you take out this chest piece, leaving two cells on his back open for attack, after which it's time to take out his newly exposed face. All the while he has three different laser turret attacks, a close range attack, and a hulk like attack to close ground on you while his grunts chase you down. Just as fun as it looks. The slam nanotrite turns you into the literal hulk, speaking of, and is by far one of the best powers in Rage 2 if used correctly. You go flying up, you come smashing down. Why don't we get more Hulk games now that I think about it? It's moments like these that make it clear that id themselves were the people that developed the bulk of combat and story while Avalanche handled the rest. This played to everyone's strength, id could create the narrative and do what they did best while maintaining some control over how the FPS mechanics were being built, and Avalanche could knock out the open world design so they've done quite well this gen. Flying the gyrocopter, the Icarus around is a great mid to late game addition that makes exploring so much more enjoyable and takes away the feeling of end game exploration grind. Seriously, get to level 7 with a doctor as quickly as possible. While we're on the topic of easy to use items, this launcher may trivialize basically every challenge in the game, but man, is it satisfying to use, I mean look at this. Shooting down these balloons gives you a reason to keep your eyes open and better yet is a good way to reward the player for exploring without adding another cluster to the map. But while you have the map open, calling in cars is incredibly easy and near seamless and makes the trials of traversing the world a bit less annoying than it otherwise would be at times. In the home stretch, the Firestorm Revolver in Overdrive is ridiculous. A Thanos snap after hitting your target and everyone within 5 feet of the slug goes up in flames, mutant rotisserie style. And let's finish it with obviously the greatest thing in the game, I mean look at this foliage when the Icarus blows it. That's how you do moving foliage people. Oh, is that some good looking grass. So what's so great about Rage 2? Well, 78 things that we don't stray into spoiler territory with. That's what's so great about Rage 2. But I have kind of a big announcement to make, guys. What's so great isn't just a series, it's going to be an entire channel. In the description and the pinned comment below, you will see a link. That link will take you to my official, real, second channel called, well, What's So Great. I always hear everybody wanting the positive side of gaming, and even I want the positive side of gaming. And that's what that channel's all about. Every episode will be the same thing. You'll know what you're getting. It's nothing but the good stuff of the newest and the old in gaming. Every episode on that channel will talk about what is so great, about the best, the worst, and everything in between. That channel is a partnership between me and someone you guys know, Jordan. This channel is our baby, and this channel is going to be getting new uploads three times a week. Right now, just now, maybe when you're watching this, or maybe a couple days later. The first video on that channel went up, it's an episode of What's So Great About Days Gone. It's over there right now, you can go check it out, the link to that will also be in the description. So if you guys want content like this, if you guys like what I do over here, you can support me even further by going over there and subscribing. Now let me be very clear, Clean Prince is not going anywhere. Thankfully, with Jordan having my back on What's So Great, that means I can keep doing what I do over here on Clean Prince. What's So Great is not replacing Clean Prince. I'll still give you guys all the content you expect over here each and every single week. That will not change. You'll just get even more gaming content if you go over there and subscribe as well. Also, we are giving away copies of Rage 2 and Days Gone over on What's So Great, so you can check that stuff out over there. But more importantly, guys, I just want to say thank you for supporting me through all of this, through everything on Clean Prince. And if you go over there, I genuinely appreciate it. None of this will be possible without you. And now it's time for me to give back to you, to give you exactly what you're asking for. And that's nothing but positivity with a whole channel's worth of content. But as always, and maybe now more than ever, I want to know what you guys think about Rage 2. What is your favorite thing about the game? Does any of this sound good to you? Does any of this sound like something that's going to make you want to pick it up? And if not, what is it about Rage 2 that's kind of got you going, hey, I don't really want this thing? 
Let me know the answer to any of those questions down in the comments below. It's a real conversation. As always, if you enjoyed this video, hit that like button. If you are not yet subscribed, hit subscribe over here and on What's So Great. On both channels, I'll be putting out gaming content each and every week, three times over there, two to three times over here. So hit subscribe here and go check that out. Like I said, description and pin comment. And until next time, guys, I'm out.